Welcome to lecture 34. So today we're going to start chapter 6, which is about multiple reactions. In chapter 4, we learned how to design isothermal reactors, mainly running single reactions. We talked about multiple reactions, but now we're going to concentrate in this chapter on multiple reactions. Seldom is the reaction of interest the only one that occurs in a chemical reactor. I know that you design a reactor hoping that your the desired reaction takes place. However, this is not really the case in reality. Other side reactions, probably undesired reactions, take place. Typically, multiple reactions will occur, some desired and some undesired. One of the key factors in the economic success of a chemical plant is the minimization of undesired side reactions that occur along with the desired reaction. So you want to actually minimize the occurrence or the extent of the undesired side reactions. In the chapter, we'll introduce the topic of multiple reactions. We describe the four basic types of multiple reactions, series, parallel, independent, and complex. Next, we define the selectivity parameter and discuss how it can be used to minimize unwanted side reactions. And we will also discuss the yield. So let's begin with the definitions. Types of multiple reactions. Let's discuss the first type, series reactions, also called consecutive reactions. They are reactions where the reactant forms an intermediate product, which reacts further to form another product. So one reaction happens after the other. That's why it's called consecutive reactions or reactions in series. Example. Let's take an example. This is the reaction of ethylene oxide, ethylene oxide, our friend, with ammonia to form mono, di, and tri ethylone, ethanol amine. Okay, so basically, you can see that the backbone of this reaction is the ammonia. And every time what I'm doing, I'm replacing the hydrogen with a molecule which is based on the ethylene oxide. So once this form with the presence of extra ethylene oxide, another molecule can be added and in the presence of really extra ethylene oxide, a third molecule can be added. And as you see, these reactions happening one after another. In recent years, the shift has been toward the production of diethylene, diethanol amine, this guy, as the desired product rather than triethanol amine. So basically, the factory had to produce more of more of this product rather than this product. So what do you think? Did they decide to close the factory because there is no market for the original product? No, they have to really introduce some changes in order to produce more of this now. Come on. And this is the role of chemical engineers. They know how to manipulate the parameters of operating conditions in order to maximize the production of one of the products. Right. Then we have the second type, which is parallel reactions, also called competing reactions. They are reactions where the reactant is consumed by two different reaction pathways to form different products. So A could go, could go to B or C. So there is a competition in which reaction happens faster. There is competition which product will be formed more. That's why it's called competing reactions or parallel reactions. Let's take an example. Okay, again, this is one of our friends. 
and this is the ethylene right so we are reacting ethylene with oxygen with oxygen which reaction could take place well in our plant we wanted to partially oxidize the ethylene to form ethylene oxide however in the presence of oxygen some of ethylene could burn right could combust to form carbon dioxide and water so as you can see these two reactions are competing against each other so the oxidation of ethylene to ethylene oxide while avoiding complete combustion to co2 and water this is a really uh, reactions in parallel right then we have complex reactions there are multiple reactions that involve a combination of both series and parallel reactions such as this reaction so we have if you look at this path it's reaction in series again reaction in series but if you look here we have reaction and reactions in parallel right so they are complex they are both together this is another example series parallel okay and then also this is another example uh, this is also a fourth example right let's take a practical example this is the formation of butadiene from ethanol butadiene so you have here c c c and c so you have it is diene okay so buta one two three four right four atoms of carbon and diene and then of course you have the rest which are hydrogen come on you are forming this product from ethanol from ethanol you can see the OH here right so what's happening really the ethanol is cracked to ethylene and water but ethanol ethanol can also be cracked to aldehyde and hydrogen then what so you can see there are there is a reaction in parallel right there is competition however later on one of the products of the first reaction reacts with the other product of the other reaction with another product from the other reaction and they form the desired reaction so you can see the reaction in series right this goes to this and then this goes to this right this is one series of course this goes to this and then this goes to this but at the same time there are uh, so this is a series but at the same time there was a parallel reaction so they're all in in like, like interconnected right you cannot separate the parallel reaction from the series reaction so we call it complex reactions the last type of reactions is independent reactions they are reactions that occur at the same time but neither the products nor reactants react with themselves or one another as you can see this is one reaction this is completely another reaction there is nothing in common no molecules in common in both these reactions an example the cracking of crude oil to form gasoline where two of the many reactions occurring are you have here c15 it's being cracked to c12 and c3 and in another completely different reaction where you have completely different molecules involved you have c8 
is crack 2 C6 and C2. Nothing in common between these two reactions. We still expect that they are occurring in the same reactor. So we have these are independent reactions. Right. I have a question here. Are these complex reactions? Well, D is your desired product. D is your desired product. So let's see. A plus B gives you C plus D. However, A reacts with the product C to form E. So you can see there is a parallel reaction where A could go to my desired product D or A could be converted to an undesired product E. So there, are, there is a reaction in parallel, but there is also reaction in series. Look at B. B is converting to C and then C is converted to E. Correct? So yeah, it's a set of complex reactions. Right. Are these series parallel or complex reactions? E is your desired product and A can be provided in excess. So I don't have problem with A. A is available in excess and then E is my desired product. So let's see. Well, this reaction can be written this way. Right, B goes to C and then C goes to E. Basically, this is the backbone of the reaction. I don't care about A much because A is abundant. It's provided in excess, right? And E is my desired product. So there is no really competition on A because we have abundant amount of A. So A was never a problem. There is no competition against A, but I can look at it now as a reaction and series. So and basically, if you have a complex reaction, you can boil it down to a series reaction, then please do that because this will help you to focus on finding the right solution um, for ma maximizing the desired product. Okay, let's talk about something which is called figures of merit. What's figures or what are figures of merit? A figure of merit is a quantity used to characterize the performance of a device, system, or method relative to its alternatives. So, say you have different devices or different systems or different methods, numerical methods for solving, you know, equations. Okay, so you have different devices, systems, or methods, and you want to know which one is better, okay? Which one is better compared to the other? So then you use a figure of merit. An example, if you want to buy a car and you don't care how luxurious it is, right? You don't care how much it costs you, so long it costs less than 20,000 BD, let's say. But you live far away from your workplace and you commute long distance. So you want a car which is very efficient when it comes to fuel consumption. All right. So for you, a figure of merit will be the fuel consumption. Of course, given the other constraint that the price should be somewhere between 10,000 and 20,000. Uh, maybe you like the color to be black and so on. Okay, but you're mainly the basis on which you're gonna choose car A or car B or car C among these available cars is the fuel efficiency. Figures of merit for CRE when you have multiple reactions. Of course, we have single reactions. Maybe you say, oh, I'll look mainly on conversion. I want to maximize conversion. But when it comes to multiple reactions, the story is different. You need two different ones. We can quantify the formation of D, desired product, with respect to U, the undesired product, by defining the selectivity and yield of the system. So selectivity, 
tells us how one product is favored over another when we have multiple reactions. What about yield? Well, I personally like to look at yield as to help us to find how much useful conversion is achieved. So let's talk about selectivity and yield, whether we have reactions in parallel or series, doesn't matter. From the introduction to chemical engineering course, again, always we go back to this course, selectivity was defined as moles of desired product formed divided by moles of undesired product formed, right? So it's a comparison between how many moles of this formed to how many moles of that formed. However, when it comes to yield, you know that we had quite few definitions, different definitions. So let's look at the first one, fractional yield. It is moles of desired product formed divided by moles would have been formed if no side reactions and conversion was 100%. So basically here, I'm comparing what I have formed actually to what I could have maximum formed. Okay, so how much maximum of D you could form. For example, if you have 100 mol per second of A is fed, and then of course, let's say, yeah, you produce only 50 moles. Okay, 50 moles, and then you can compare it to how much maximum you could have formed. Well, Maximum you could have formed 200, right? Because you have fed 100 mol per second of A, so maximum you could have formed 200. How did I calculate 200? Well, I said if all of the 100 mol per second has converted and there was no side reaction, then 200 moles of per second of D would have been formed. Okay, so that's around 25%. Okay, then the second definition, which is less restrictive. Okay, so there's less obligation, less expected from me. How is that? Let's see. The yield, which is also fractional, this definition, equals the number of moles of desired product formed among moles of desired product formed which we said voila it is 50 okay divided by moles would have been formed for the given x when no side reactions when no side reactions so basically i'm saying don't hold me responsible for what i'm what i'm feeding and what i'm not converting Okay, just hold me responsible for what conversion I have. Yes, I know I'm feeding 100 mol per second of A, but actually not all of it is converting. Well, how much is converting then? Well, let's say 50% is converting. So if you have 50% converting, then that means only 50 moles per second of A will convert, and therefore this will give you 100 mol of D, right? Okay, so that's 50 percent so there's less restriction on this definition but in both definitions we can express the values and percentage or they are both fractional because they vary between zero to one because i'm comparing number of moles of the same species right then comes a third definition which is even less restrictive that is moles of desired product form divided by moles of reactant fed so just look at how many moles of D you are forming. Well, uh, we have 50 moles of D and how much you're feeding? We said 100. So the ratio is 1 to 2. Okay, it's not fractional, it's not percentage. Come on, it's only a ratio. Moles of desired product formed divided by moles of reactant fit. Then comes the last definition which is even with less restriction i'm saying just don't hold me responsible for how much i'm feeding for what i'm feeding hold me responsible for what is converted out of this amount that is fed 
تمام so we look at most of these are product formed again we said 50 and we look we divided by moles of reactant consumed in the reactor we said we have 50 percent conversion so that means only 50 moles of a is converted so the ratio is one okay so this is less restriction again the last two definitions are not really in percentage or not fractional definitions type and in this textbook we take the last definition of yield which is moles of desired product formed divided by moles of reactant consumed in the reactor okay when it comes to selectivity and yield we actually have two types of these so selectivity and yield can be based on the ratio of the reaction rates in this case we call it instantaneous selectivity and yield or on the ratio of molar flow rates in this case we call them overall selectivity and overall yield let's take an example okay or let's look at the equations of the definition of each so when it comes to selectivity instantaneous selectivity is du is selectivity of d compared to u is rd divided by ru but when it comes to the overall we look at the molar flow rate or the number of moles so that's s to the tilde f a f d minus f d naught that's how many moles of d formed divided by f u minus f u naught how many moles of u formed so that's a ratio of number of moles but what the instantaneous selectivity is a ratio of rates reaction rates rates of formation okay let's go to yield yield will be defined the instantaneous yield defined as y d r d divided by minus r a however it comes to the overall yield is a ratio of number of moles so it will be number of moles of d formed f d minus f d naught divided by number of moles of a consumed which is calculated as or from f a naught minus f a so again we have two types instantaneous selectivity and yield or the overall selectivity and yield here shabab of course a is the key reactant d is the desired product and u is the undesired product for ccr the instantaneous and overall values are the same go ahead and use these definitions and the design equation to figure out that they are both the same for ccr okay if if d naught and if u naught are zero then we can simplify the previous equations and write it the way that you see it here but let me let me just emphasize on the fact when we say rd we mean the net rate of formation of d come on or we say r a we mean the net rate of formation of a or minus r a would be we mean minus r a net that is the net rate of consumption of the reactant a for an economic standpoint when it comes to money okay selling revenue profits the overall selectivities and yields are important in determining profits right because when you sell you sell according to quantity which is identified or quantified by the number of moles come on however instantaneous selectivities give insights in choosing reactors and reaction schemes that will help maximize the profit so if you want to calculate the profit you look at the overall selectivity and yield if you want to know how to maximize the overall selectivities how to maximize the overall production of a of the desired product then we look at the instantaneous selectivity there often is a conflict between selectivity and conversion hmm. So there's a conflict between conversion and selectivity. How is that? Because you want to make a lot of your desired product and at the same time minimize the undesired product. So basically you will say, oh, I want to produce a lot, right? So you will say, okay, make, go to the highest conversion. 
but the problem is when you go to the highest conversion you'll be not only producing the desired product you could be producing also the undesired product so this will reduce for you this could reduce for you the selectivity okay so where you see the selectivity is high the conversion could be low and vice versa however in many instances the greater conversion you achieve not only do you make more d but you also form more u so yeah more x doesn't necessarily mean you're only getting more d but you could also produce more u in fact sometimes you could promote the formation of u over the, the formation of d if you go to high conversion we'll take an example and better understand this okay with this we reach the end of segment one and we'll meet again soon with segment 2.